shortly after my dad passed away, and Rich and I were looking for a place, a community, where we could grow with the community and give and um, find a group of people who were committed to love and justice and to a faith in the future. And we found that here. I can remember that first service being brought to tears and also being brought home. It felt like this was this is where I wanted to be. Probably like a lot of you, um, I've done a lot of different things in my life. I've been often circled around education and environment and justice. Um, I like to be outside an awful lot. I spend a lot of time uh, outdoors hiking and gardening and birding and cycling, just all kinds of things. In terms of work and organizations, I still focus on that environment, um, education and justice piece. And I guess after being called a campus radical in Texas when I was back there for protesting the Vietnam War and standing up for civil rights for everybody, I kind of moved in that direction in terms of work as well. Um, I started a K through 12 school in Texas that was um, a place where students could work with the faculty to design their own curriculum and become active in their community to stand up for what they believed in. As a wildlife biologist a few years later in Texas, um, and then later in the Northwest when I moved up here, uh, it, one of the things that really struck me was that in addition to the work we were doing in science, I saw something that may sound like it's uh, peripheral to science, but at the time especially it was not in any light. And that was that the questions and the knowledge of women who were rare in the profession at that time, and of indigenous peoples were discounted and dismissed. And that experience is one of the reasons why when I moved up to Washington, I became a faculty member in the WSU Department of Women's Studies and later in the Department of Critical Culture, Gender, and Race Studies. And I, I studied and uh, taught on the intersections between science and our social constructions and how does that intersection, those sets of ideologies that are set up, influence our policy and our values toward the environment and toward all kinds of groups of people. I'm retired now from that and I am happy to be the co-leader of the Police Citizens uh, Climate Lobby with Mary Dupree. And we work hard in our local communities all the way to the national to try to have an action of policy and um, programs that will bring swift climate action and just climate action to our communities and our world. So I hope every one of you is a celebrant at some point so I can hear about your journey. That'd be great. I'd like to extend um, a special welcome today to all of those who are joining us for the first time. We're glad that you're here. If you've come in person, you should have received a welcome packet with an information card in it. And if you fill that out and drop it in the operatory basket as it comes around, uh, you'll be in, we'll be in touch with you with information uh, that you might want. And there are also people in the audience that have on yellow name tags, and they we can answer your questions. If you're online, uh, there is a link on our website to an electronic version of that card, and you can use it for the same purpose and we will get in touch with you. Whether you are new or not, please consider staying for coffee and conversation downstairs in the fellowship hall or on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, that stays open as well. And today you'll be able to join in a conversation about these worship services if you're here and stay for coffee and conversation. And now let us say our words of welcome together. Whether this is your first or thousandth Sunday with us, whether you stroll, roll, zoom, ran, or danced in, we are glad you chose to join us. We are one people of many beliefs, identities, origins, sexuality, and gender. Now we'll take a moment to say hello across the digital divide. First, we're going to show the people joining on Zoom. So if you're at home, please turn on your camera, and you'll appear on our screen. Now people at home, wave. Now people who are attending the service in our building, it's your turn to wave. Great. We do have some announcements this morning. Um, do you want to do the one on, on video first? 
<laughs> Go for it. <laughs> service is most meaningful to you? What make, might make our worship service even more meaningful? The worship committee would like to have your answer to these two questions. We're going to have a dessert and discussion following the service next Sunday, April 23rd from 1130 to 1230. We are reviving a tradition in our church called dessert and discussion, where everybody has a chance to share their opinions and listen to the ideas of others. It doesn't take very long. We sit in a circle, a mic is passed around, people can choose to answer or pass and just listen. But most importantly, we want to hear what you have to say about our worship services. If you have any questions, you can email me um, or Peggy Jenkins. And I look forward to finding out what your answers to these two questions are. Following our dessert and discussion, if you didn't have a chance to participate, there will be an opportunity to submit a written, a written answer. Anyway, thank you for being part of our worship and helping make it even more meaningful to you. Our second announcement is about the Navigators Award Ceremony. UUCP's resident scouting troop, Navigators USA, is thrilled to officially announce our first annual award ceremony. The event will be held on this Saturday, April 29th, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. in this sanctuary and all friends and members of the church are invited. At this event, we'll share the history of navigators and our troop, present the kids with our uniforms and badges, and share our many exciting experiences and achievements from the past year. There'll also be a bake sale, craft sale fundraiser, and a reception afterwards. Please come help support these amazing kids. And the next announcement is about the Renaissance Fair. Um, it's almost here again. The UUCP will have our food booth again at the Renaissance Fair on May 6th and 5th, May 6th and 5th at the East City Park. We need help. We need people to set up and take down the booth, make food wonderful, and wonderful desserts, and to staff the booth. Our proceeds will go to a worthy local cause. Please check out the sign up on Facebook or in an email from the church. If you, and if you have any questions, contact Ken Fonts and he's got his um, email address as fontskin at gmail.com. Here in the announcements. We preface our service by acknowledging our church was built on the ancestral homelands of the Nimi Sioux. <laughs> Called the Nez Perce by the French-speaking traders, the Palouse, and the Shishmoops, called the Coeur d'Alene. Let us pause and remember that we live on ground that is sacred, ground that was stolen, ground that cries out for justice and responsible stewardship. May our remembering help us find the courage to do our part to restore wholeness to the earth and all her peoples. We're hoping that the folks at home um, in joining us by Zoom have a chalice or a candle and something to light it with. Uh, so that we can light our chalices together. We'll do that now. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to see and see to share.
International Earth Day. Did anyone go to the Earth Day Fest at East City Park? Ah, oh, I see a few hands. What about the city cleanup, the downtown cleanup on Friday? You want to do that? If you miss it, there's still the Arbor Day tree planting this coming Friday, the 28th, at the Moscow Public Library. They're giving out seedlings. Meanwhile, in Pullman, there was a stream cleanup, a pizza party, and a rally urging WSU to divest from fossil fuels. Anybody to go to any of those? No, and tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Hick, who I know through the Moscow City Climate Action Working Group, will be giving a talk on campus. There's more free pizza, and they're also giving out seedlings. The, um, our climate plan actually got passed just a few months ago. I think we lit a candle for it um, here in Moscow. We worked really hard on that, and uh, it's, it's really good, and it's being taken as a model for cities across the state, which is exciting. Also, you may not know, but the city, but we got an award from the mayor. <laughs> We got, a, we got a 2023 Mayor's Earth Day Award. Somebody needs to figure out how to frame that and get it up on the wall somewhere. Okay. <laughs> so today, for our service, we'll also be celebrating Earth Day, and we'll be celebrating by exploring a practice of listening deeply to animals, plants, and the planet itself. These opening words are penned by my colleague, the Re Reverend Gretchen Haley, so I abbreviate them slightly. Because the tides are rising, so must we rise to this moment, to this day, to this life, this place in the web that is yours and ours. Rise, because the earth remains our only home. So rise with gratitude for this beauty, this chance to be a part of it all, to give back, to weave life, past, present, future, everywhere, always as one. And let us now rise in body or spirit to sing our opening hymn, number 64 in the gray hymnal, O Give Us Pleasure. Ah. Let's try that again. Hello. Hello. Okay. Just a little feedbacky. Uh, all right. So this is a new one for us. Uh, so for those of you who are... Um, uh, hymnal friendly. Uh, it's uh, number 64. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, Trillium, our group with, uh, with Mac and Janice and Joseph, sang this for us. Um, so what I'm going to do is play it through completely just so you can hear the parts and get a feel for it. Uh, and then um, we can start singing. We're going to do all four verses. Um, but it's a... Hello? Okay. But it's a really beautiful text from Robert Frost, and this is one that I would like to kind of add to the rotation. So uh, we'll get a couple chances to sing it um, this spring, um, and I hope you like it.
moment to engage in the practice of generosity together. For those of you able to make a financial contribution, the logistics are on your screen. We typically give away all the cash from our Sunday offering to local charities whose missions align with our values, a program called the Month of Sundays. This month, the recipient is the Leitao Recovery Center, whose mission is to support people in recovery from addictions and behavioral health disorders through peer-to-peer -peer interaction and evidence-based practices to promote a healthy community. To donate, please indicate Month of Sundays on your check or from the online drop-down menu. In the spirit of love and for the continuing work of this church, we will now take some time to practice generosity together. words to introduce our time of quiet are Make the Earth Your Companion by J. Patrick Lewis. Make the earth your companion. Walk lightly on it as other creatures do. Let the sky paint her beauty. She is always watching over you. Learn from the sea how to face harsh forces. Let the river remind you that everything will pass. Let the lake instruct you in stillness. Let the mountain teach you grandeur. Make the woodland your house of peace. Make the rainforest your house of hope. Meet the wetland on twilight ground. Save some small piece of grassland for a red kite on a windy day. Watch the ice caps glisten with crystal majesty. Hear the desert whisper, hush to eternity. Let the town weave a small basket of togetherness. Make the earth your companion. Walk lightly on it as other creatures do. Let's rest in silence for a moment together.
and blessed be.
I have two short readings this morning. They were written hundreds of years apart. So just to lift up that this message has been coming to us through the ages. The first is by Henry David Thoreau in Walden. If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy and life emits a fragrance like flowers and sweet scented herbs is more elastic, more starry, more immortal. That is your success. All nature is your congratulation and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. The greatest gains and values are farthest from being appreciated. We easily come to doubt if they exist. We soon forget them. They are the highest reality. Perhaps the facts most astounding and most real are never communicated by man to man. The true harvest of my daily light is, life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It is a little stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. And the second reading is by indigenous biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass. Imagine seeing your grandmother standing at the stove in her apron and then saying of her, look, it is making soup. It has gray hair. We might snicker at such a mistake, but we also recoil from it. In English, we never refer to a member of our family or indeed to any person as it. That would be a profound act of disrespect. It robs a person of selfhood and kinship, reducing a person to a mere thing. So it is that in Potawatomi and most other indigenous languages, we use the same words to address the living world as we use for our family, because they are our family. So what happens when we practice this other way to listen, when we listen to the trees, the hills, the river, the soil, the animals? The first thing that happens for me is that a tremendous tenderness wells up toward everything. I walk through Idler's Rest and I don't just admire the cedars, I love the cedars. And I may be imagining things, but it feels like they love me back. Now my family teases me about this. In particular, uh, they remember the year that I planted too many snap peas. It was my first year gardening, we lived on the west side, and I started the whole seed bag full of snap peas. Um, so there must have been at least like 40 or 50 little seedlings. And when it came time to transplant, they were all thriving. I mean, I, I'd never done this before. I didn't know if they'd all make it. So anyway, they were all thriving. So I filled up first one of my raised beds and then a second of my raised beds. And then I started tucking them against the garden wall next to the compost bin alongside the porch. When it came time to harvest, we had so many pea pods. We gave them to all of our friends. I brought huge salad bowls full of them to church several weeks in a row. They were sweet and delicious. And when my family gave me a hard time about planting so many peas, why didn't you just compost the extra seedlings? I said, well, I didn't want to hurt their feelings. <laughs> so am I imagining things? Am I simply anthropomorphizing or projecting, or am I picking up somehow on subtle clues? Am I listening in such a way that I'm in relationship with these plants? Is there a value in trying to do that, to be in relationship with the world this way? In Martin Buber's seminal work, I and Thou, he differentiates between a world in which people see one another as objects, that I-it relationship that makes us recoil, and one in which we relate to each other as subjects. He calls that an I-thou relationship. So in the I-thou relationship, rather than defining other people based on the ways they impact or touch us, we grant to each and every other human being sacred status. We recognize there's a whole life behind their eyes. Everybody has inherent worth and dignity. Everybody is the star of their own story rather than a bit player in hours. We can expand on that, entering into an I-thou relationship, not just with other humans, but with beings and places in the natural world. This is actually a more common way of handling things than you might think. 
In many indigenous cultures, all things, plants, animals, rocks, and mountains are considered people and are related to with that I, thou spirit. The only thing that these nations call it are things made by humans. Chairs, cars, asphalt, roads, everything else, everything else has a life, has agency, has a voice. When you approach the world this way, you find yourself moving through a complex and dynamic landscape. The animals, the plants, even geological and hydrological features have a voice, have something to teach. And if we listen carefully enough, we can learn from them. Now, evidence abounds that animals actually do communicate with one another, both within and across species. They use visual signals, movements, colors, and postures, as well as auditory signals, noises. And then there are pheromone, pheromones. And human scientists, when they listen and observe carefully, are able to decode these signals. There's a wealth of literature that details studies of animal behavior and communication strategies. But those of us who have pets know that experimentation isn't the only way to learn to listen to animals. We learn through relationship, a little bit by trial and error. Some things our own animal bodies understand instinctively. We recognize signs of defensiveness when an animal is telling us to back off. We recognize signs of aggression. If a bull is about to charge us, we don't need a translator to tell us that. We can tell when an animal is feeling threatened, sad, or bored, or lonely. We can see when they're feeling playful or joyful. To have compassion is to feel with, and we naturally have compassion for other animals. There's a reason why those ads narrated by Sarah McLaughlin raise so much money for the Humane Society. <laughs> if we enter into an I-thou relationship with animals, it gets a lot harder to justify treating them inhumanely. Factory farms treat animals as if they were commodities, as if they were its. So how might farming and animal husbandry shift or change or evolve if we were to insist on the I-thou relationship, if we were to listen to those animals' stories. Now plants, we know, communicate with one another as well. I um, follow the research on um, the my mycorrhizal networks, right? Have, have you read about that too? It's utterly fascinating. They call it the World Wide Web. Individual plants and trees connect to one another through this um, mycelium network, they send minerals, they send moisture and nitrogen um, to each other, to the ones that need it so every, every plant can thrive. Um, and again, there are studies of detailing how, studies detailing how this works, but there's also something intuitive. When you go in the forest, you can feel that it's all connected. We can tell just by looking at plants whether they're happy and healthy or struggling. When I see a clear cut, it breaks my heart. It feels like a huge scar, an act of profound violence. I try to cultivate a relationship with the plants in my yard and garden. I try to ask them what they need. I try to support their well-being. I have a brown thumb, <laughs> not a green one, but I'm learning, and I'm learning from the plants themselves. It's a relationship, it's really a partnership. One of my major takeaways from Robin Kimmerer Wall's braiding sweetgrass was that humans and plants actually co-evolved. Strands of sweetgrass that were tended in traditional ways did better than those that were left alone with no human intervention. So we're part of the network of the wood wide web. Plants need us just as we need them. I mean, we have to eat, but if we acknowledge that our food comes from sacred beings, then perhaps we'll eat a little more mindfully and gratefully. So then what about inanimate objects? Turns out they have voices too. Glaciers breathe, rock shifts and erodes and changes, usually at a pace so slow that we can't see it. Sometimes I like to think about the fact that on a molecular level, even the most solid seeming objects 
are made up of these fast-moving subatomic particles and a lot of empty space. It's not so much of a stretch to believe that they might be humming along at a frequency we can't quite measure. I love thinking in geologic time, if we can tune into the voice of that 3.8 million year old basalt, the stories, the stories it has to tell us. And we are learning. Geologists are decoding the language of rocks. Meteorologists listen to the sky. Close observation is the first step and an attitude of reverence is the next for us lay people. Regardless of whether we're imagining, projecting, or actually tuning into something real, the practice of treating the natural world and its inhabitants as sacred subjects, including listening for what they have to say or teach us, turns out to be better for our physical and mental health than listening to, say, cable news. <laughs> it's also better for the planet. The American Psychological Association asserts, from a stroll through a city park to a day spent hiking in the wilderness, exposure to nature has been linked to a host of benefits, including improved attention, lower stress, better mood, reduced risk of psychiatric disorder, and even upticks in empathy and cooperation. Most research so far has focused on green spaces, such as parks and forests, but researchers are now also beginning to study the benefits of blue spaces, places with river and ocean views. There's even a mindfulness practice called shirinyoku, or forest bathing. In National Geographic, Sonny Fitzgerald writes, forest bathing is not just for the wilderness lover. The practice can be as simple as walking in any natural environment and consciously connecting with what's around you. Some of you may remember that on my sabbatical back in 2019, I maintained a practice of writing a poem every day. And most often, what I wrote were accounts of conversations that I had with the natural world. Like this one, which I called Desert Butterfly. You wouldn't think it, but the desert is full of butterflies in early March. They flutter through sunbeams, perch on chaparral, and decorate the wind windshield in saffron schmears. Then there is this one, somehow inside the car, exploring this strange terrain, landing on the dashboard to look me in the eye saying, let go of your need for structure. Let yourself liquefy. This is the only way to lose your landlubber legs and learn to fly. I swear to God, that's exactly what it said. <laughs> or then there was this one. Traveling through the forest after the fire, the hillside looks like giant shins covered with thick black stubble. Yet somehow, even stripped of branches, twigs, needles, and barks, the trees retain their dignity, straight as arrows, unbowed, unbent, rooted deeply in the soil of home. Draw near, feel the scope of the loss, thousands of lives, each older than the oldest human, gone in the space of days. What once was rough, sticky bark, now greasy charcoal, painted on face, hands, heart, sackcloth, and ashes, in their spear-shaped shadows, new growth, and their ghosts, bend near, riffle my hair, say, all things end, sweetheart, and sometimes in tragedy. See how life itself undaunted simply sprouts from the wreckage? Be at peace, love. Let your life too be fodder for the flame. What's the gift for if not to nourish those who come next, if not to light up the sky? Now, in the course of my sabbatical, I wrote poems that relayed conversations I had with pelicans, condors, a chukka in Greece, and a raven in Painted Desert National Park. Hoodoos in Bryce Canyon spoke to me, and rivers, the light and the wind, layers of rock that made up the Grand Canyon. And maybe I am, maybe I am imagining things, but I'll tell you what, I am in very, very good company. So many poets, philosophers, and mystics have been inspired by or perhaps attuned to the natural world. Mary Oliver leaps to mind, of course, and Wendell Berry and Mae Sarton. But even Thich Nhat Hanh listened to and spoke with the natural world. He wrote this beautiful piece. Dear Mother, I bow down before you with utmost respect and the clear awareness that you are present in me and that I am a part of you. You gave birth to me and provided me with everything I needed for my nourishment. 
You gave me air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, and medicinal herbs to heal me when I was sick. Because you gave birth to me once, I know that you will continue to give birth to me again and again in the future. That is why I can never die. Each time I manifest, I am fresh and new, and each time I return, you receive and embrace me with great compassion. You are the great earth. You are Terra. You are Gaia. You are this beautiful blue planet. You are the earth-refreshing bodhisattva, fragrant, cool, kind, and pure. You are infinitely beautiful. You have the great capacity of receiving, taking care of, and transforming everything, including filth of all kinds, poisonous fumes, and even radioactive waste. Time is with you to do this work, and you will do it even if it takes a million years. You have numerous children, millions of species, amongst which the human species is just one. Many of us humans, blinded by greed, pride, and delusion, have been unable to recognize you as our mother. That is why we have caused so much suffering to one another and have damaged your health and your beauty. We know that you have enough energy to embrace and transform our mistakes. But our deluded minds continue to push us to exploit you and create conflicts. We come by our deluded minds honestly. For hundreds of years, culture has been trying to convince us to see ourselves as the center of the story. It has desacralized and commodified everything on this precious planet. Our culture worships rugged individualism. If we listen to the natural world, we're reminded that in reality, life is all about interdependence. Our culture tries to put us in boxes. If we listen to the natural world, it whispers to us of infinite variety every leaf on every tree completely unique. Our culture is currently persecuting trans people, insisting on forcing a strict gender binary. Meanwhile, I came across this meme the other day. Alex, could you put the meme up? It reads, once I was at the optometrist and he was measuring my ability to see colors and he said, the thing about biology is that nature doesn't really do binaries, only spectrums. And I think about that a lot. In this time when we're reaching the limits of, of a consumer culture that objectifies and commodifies everything, including people, reconnecting to reality with the deep understanding that everything that exists is sacred can shift our perceptions and then our opinions and then our behavior towards sanity and sustainability. So this is your homework assignment. Every day, try to listen to something that isn't human. Cultivate relationships with the wind, with plants and animals, with rocks or sunlight or the northern lights, with meteor showers. When we turn off our devices and turn away from the false teachings of culture, we will invariably find inspiration, healing, and hope. We human beings and our society are not separate from nature or each other. We are part of an interdependent web of all life. We need to trust those connections. We need to listen to the messages flowing toward us through that web. As we practice this other way to listen, we will remember ourselves. We'll come to understand that we are a part of nature, not separate from it. We'll remember that everything is sacred, everything is connected, and from that place, we'll know what we must change in order to survive and thrive on this miraculous, complex, sacred, beautiful planet of ours. Happy Earth Day. So be it, and so may it be. Let's join in singing hymn number 163 for the Earth Forever Turning.
For our closing reading today, we have a poem by Margaret Atwood called The Moment. The moment when after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belong to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. Let's join now in singing our sung benediction, There is a Love. Okay, so let's try something. We've all been singing so beautifully today. Um, oh, are we going to do it as a as we'll a round? We'll do it as a round, yes. Okay, <laughs> so it's actually a, a round, so, we'll, um, so you'll sing the, okay, so she'll play it. Um, we'll just do it in two parts, so you'll sing there. There is a love, da, 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 da. and then whoever wants to sing part two sings that again. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> so part two comes in on the second line, okay. Okay. Please join me in the words to extinguish our chalice. Judy, would you mind going and, and doing that? We extinguish this chalice that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light our paths as we leave this place. May it guide our way until we are together again. You know that love, that love is the interconnected web. It's the love of the planet. It springs up from the center of the earth and it does hold us all and it connects us all. And that means that everything we do matters. So lean into the love and do what is right and good. Listen, listen to the, the planet and it won't steer you wrong. I love you all. Have a good week. I'll see you when I get back from South Carolina. <laughs> when are you uh, Monday. Monday. Are you going to work? I'm. Uh, it's. It's. Working.